I, Wing Commander Inayat Kabir, along with my colleague, Dr. Nishant Sharma, from the Department of Hospital Administration, Ames, would be taking you to the next two sessions. Telemedicine has been instrumental in overcoming the distance barrier and providing access to quality healthcare in the far-flung areas of the country. This session would give us an insight into legal, ethical, and the administrative issues pertaining to telemedicine and electronic consultation. Now we would like to welcome the esteemed panelists for the session. Dr. S.K. Mishra, Professor and Head, Department of Endocrine Surgery, and Faculty in Charge Telemedicine Program at SGPGI Lucknow. <laughs> Professor Satya Murthy, former Director, Telemedicine, Indian Space Research Organization, and also the former President of Telemedicine Society of India. <laughs> Dr. Deepak Agarwal, Professor Neurosurgery and Chairman Computer Facility at Ames, New Delhi. We are pleased to have among us Colonel R.K. Chaturvedi, the chairman of Drishti, a trust which helps underprivileged people and also to conduct research in healthcare areas. He has dedicated 31 years of his professional life to the Armed Forces Medical Services, during which he held key positions like Joint Director DG AFMS, Medical Superintendent Command Hospital Pune, and Professor, Hospital Administration, Armed Forces Medical College. He was awarded Chief of Army Staff Commendation twice in his career for his meritorious service. After premature retirement, he has held key administrative appointments in various institu institutions of national repute. He's a keen golfer and a mountaineer. Colonel Chaturvedi has conquered the second highest peak in the world, Mount Kamet, which stands at an astounding 7,750 meters above the sea level. So may we now request you to kindly give an overview on the topic and moderate the session. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to correct two things uh, that I was director GSS hospital, but not now. Last year I left that. And second is the Comet is not second highest in the world. It's in the in India. In country, it is second highest. I feel it's my proud privilege to address this August gathering and I compliment and thank Dr. Shakti Gupta to organize such a wonderful conclave and include such an important subject, which is futuristic. Ladies and gentlemen, my journey starts as this hall is, this Jorawar Singh Hall. Jorawar Singh was the great warrior and general, and in the 18th century, he conquered complete JNK, including Afghanistan, and went up to Nepal. You can see, and the hall is named after him. My journey also starts with JNK, and uh, we first time presented a concert paper after 1990 war, 1999 Kargil war. I was in Delhi that time, and. We claimed that not a single casualty died after reaching hospital or any medical facility. But what happened to those who could not reach? We saw that accident and trauma services and all. And we find golden period that if we can give some attendance during golden period, we could have saved. So when I reached the FMC, we sent a first concert paper. In concert paper, what we did was we included all forward localities where there are no medical facilities. Dr. Satyamurti, he gave us the wavelength, he gave us 
though it was in KBPS, but yes, ISRO gave something. And then it was connected to Leh, it was connected to Shinaga, Udampo, Jammu, and RNR Hospital Delhi. Why it is important, I'm saying that that time what we thought we need now also, FMC we gave the role that it should be a regulator. They'll not indulge in active telemedicine, but they'll see, they'll receive what has come, what has been prescribed, and they'll see outcome analysis, that what went wrong where, and then prepare an SOP and forward it. Though it took four, five years to fructify, but it has happened. My next experience was at Japo, Bhagwan Mahavir Cancer Hospital, where we developed a van which was on 30 feet chassis, which could do X-ray, ultrasound, mammography, endoscopy, proctoscopy, small lab, and everything could have been telecasted or it could have been signals could be sent to the hospital. And thus, patient could get a tertiary care cancer consultation from his home and hearth. The van will move every time. Our next journey was in Chhattisgarh. I was with the Vedanta group. Chhattisgarh is the most used to be most backward state, mineral rich of course, very poor infrastructure, health infrastructure. So we propose them hub and spoke model. Why it is important because to take care of 130 crore people, we need telemedicine. And now this model which we gave that Raipur will be the tertiary hub. Then seven district we had spoke. From those seven spokes, we'll have five vans going to different direction. Thus, no patient have to travel more than 10 kilometers from his home and he can get consultation sitting there. Now these things can be converted into kiosk, which my panelists will be talking about. And third place was Mysore where we made a proper planning and a big telemedicine center. And uh, we had connectivity with all districts. A state government approached us that can we assimilate the trauma and accident services with telemedicine. It was, of course, already existing in Hyderabad and other states. But here it was that we divide all facilities on geospatial network that this is L1, L2, L3 with the standardized level that what all facilities should be there. Ties the patient at accident site and divert him to direct that facility where he requires. We definitely helped them and it was in place after I left, but it was definitely there. One very interesting thing happened there. My radiology department, they asked, sir, I want to have independent lease line. Yes, given. I want a separate chamber. Yes, given. But during various interactions, I found that consultants were not writing reports. Reports were written by residents. And I was getting constant complaints. I decided I should go there and see it. When I actually went there, I found that my professor, he was seeing Terry radiology, all cases which were referred from America, from US, and giving reports on that. He was not seeing my patients. I asked him, 
just curiosity that what it is tele radiology and how you do it sir sir it is very difficult we have to pass through so many stages and then we are registered with them then only they'll be sending the images here and we have to work in a very ethical manner confidentiality and everything has to be i say what is this i'm paying him the poor taxpayer is paying him salary and he's working for us and talking of ethics so they have ethics they can enforce ethics here in my country but when i find we have no framework for tele radiology any ethicals or anything i visited tata memorial hospital they were doing tele histology histopathology i met the hod then started it free of cost then they started that we must charge something i asked what are the problems they say 90% of the reports we don't get the reimbursement no one pays any legal framework not what we know of now when we see it be amazing that tomorrow when i tell architect that i don't want opd in hospital where we stand today opd less hospital why that instead of patient coming to opd my opd or my hospital will go to the bedroom or patient's room i'll have kiosks at remote places it may be bastar it may be somewhere else we had it in uh, masur the satellite center about 100 kilometers we had that uh, there is mat sutur 30 kilometers one locality we had we are using tele ophthalmology where we can see retina we can see uh, uh, lens anti chamber we can diagnose glaucoma we can diagnose hypertension we can diagnose diabetes mellitus and of course now you can have tele stethoscope also you can have tele ultrasound also you have tele x ray already now tell me what else you require you see it prescribe give medicine in De uh, jaipur they tried medicine vending machine that you give them prescription feed it and like milk booth medicines come out but then pharmacy council of india raised objection that there has to be pharmacist what happens if machine vends wrong medicine patient doesn't know he is uneducated now you find mobile medicine mobile becomes the hub earlier it was that you do teleconferencing you do go on skype uh, you have a teleconference telepresence and now you can have it everything on mobile and after mobile also another issue is this app i have chest pain i simply go and say chest pain it gives me that where you have put your finger there ask certain questions and after that he said this is what it is before going to hospital take one tablet sorbitate sublingually and go there what happens any regulation what i have told so far no where i was asked to have license no where i was asked that what are regulatory authorities we have clinical establishment act but no where they describe the limits in telemedicine a patient has to uh, arm con uh, giving consultancy let's say from delhi patient is in maharashtra today done he goes to kolkata tomorrow and location i know that patient is in kolkata i say sorry i don't want to face three months imprisonment if something goes wrong what will patient do we have discussed so many things but state is still health is still in concurrent list state has separate central has separate if we can have common gst why can't we have common health laws which are applicable 
across. In the morning, Mr. Pandey was talking about that we are trying that uh, laws and insurance agencies which are effective in America should be capable of providing it in India also, or Singapore also, in Gulf countries also. But in our own country, first, we can do that. Let's do. So in next uh, 40 minutes or so, we'll be talking to our panelists about it. Uh, my first question is to Dr. Mishra. So you got uh, only institute of telemedicine or a school of telemedicine in the country or rather in Asia and such vast experience. Can you tell us that how you deal with legal, ethical and other aspects while teaching them? And what is your wish list that what should have been there in place, regulatory framework? so as to make it very effective in this country. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, all the delegates. It's a privilege to be here and thanks to Dr. Gupta to keep this uh, session uh, in this uh, health ecosystems, legal ethical issues. Uh, I'm from the School of Telemedicine, uh, which is the only institute uh, uh, in the Pacific uh, involved in the research and development and uh, offering training programs uh, in all areas of the health IT. So uh, all of you know that uh, you must be reading everywhere and day in and day out people must be talking about uh, and so many apps are coming up, and Colonel uh, Chaturvedi has just given an introduction. So I started with this cotton uh, that will uh, exemplify what is telemedicine. I mean, it should reach uh, to the far-flung areas, uh, even in the villages and tribals. So uh, the, the, the purpose of telemedicine, one has to understand, is to understand about the ecosystems of legal and ethical issues in telemedicine. I mean, the purpose is to outreach uh, the health services, healthcare delivery. It's more important uh, uh, using the information communication technologies. It's a faster mode of things, cheaper mode, and it can offer you uh, to reach out to, to consultants and to give a medical consultation or carry out follow-up services. You can keep the records of the patients who are giving uh, services and also uh, share required uh, information. Of obviously, the health system is going to improve uh, with this kind of technology in place. Now, one has to really understand uh, and also be very clear uh, that what is uh, telemedicine, what is not telemedicine. I mean, if you have read the history of telemedicine, earlier it was a telephonic medicine. So even somebody calls up, somebody uh, whether landline or mobile, anything like that, or send a fax. Now it is email, WhatsApp, all those things. Is it all in telemedicine? I mean, this is still the debate is going on. Some agree, some don't agree. Uh, ATA, American Telemedicine Association, and some states in the US, they think everything is telemedicine. But uh, many others, they don't. They say that there has to be effective video conferencing going on or effective store on forward uh, interaction going on uh, rather than sending a fax or email. So if you come to the understand the legal and ethical systems or administration, because it's a technology, a technology is being applied into health systems. So you you involve around so many stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders? If you see here, uh, all these people who are involved in the stakeholders are there in this list. And of course, centering around the patient. It's a patient-centric activity. So patient is the center and every, every others revolve around it. So doctor, administrator, pharmacy or insurer, or pay, payers, everybody is revolving around uh, the patient. That's the patient is uh, number one in the list. Now, all these three words, legal, ethical, administrative. This may appear very separate. But if you look at the applications, if you have experienced yourself, you find all three are interconnected actually. So we cannot just separate one from the uh, one from the other. At the same time, please do understand from this cartoon, now technology has become really what you call gigantic. It has become really what you call it. It's just very difficult control. Just imagine WhatsApp, all the social media, you don't have any control do have any legal ethical issues uh, addressed in these things. You just cannot. Technology is going ahead of you. 
you can see here it is uncontrollable every day in and day out you find some issues are coming up in the media and we have to really take a look at that also. At the same time you say that you can just take a consent and carry out your exchanges of information between doctor and patient. Oh, that is not everything. Are you, it is just like uh, taking a bank loan where there are letters written in uh, I do not know what font, maybe one or two font size where you do not see at all, you just sign it. When there is a problem, you encounter that uh, there is some issue written there and you have not noticed it. Now, do you think your poor patient in the village will go through those uh, consent form and read those micro letters to say that, uh, okay, uh, I give the consent to to offer telemedicine services, no. So, that is the kind of thing one has to understand that the, the patient, doctors and the service providers, all of them should understand uh, that this is a technology enabled applications where you have to really be very, very careful what you do and what you do not do. But behind everything again, the communication that you have been discussing in previous sessions also to explain the patient that how, what is this technology and what is supposed to do. Now, we we'll look at this cartoon actually. In the, in the, in the day to day practice, we fight uh, doctors who are, who, who are in this uh, audience, they fight, oh, I have seen this patient uh, last OPD, how come this patient has gone to you? I mean, this also exists in telemedicine. I mean, in telemedicine, it is a, a cyber uh, 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 ecosystem. Nobody knows where the patient goes. So, so today, you have a patient has shown you and tomorrow somebody has shown you, another person, then who is responsible if something happens to the patient. So, that is another thing. And coming to this cartoon on ethics, bioethics, medical ethics, legal ethics, ethics and ethics. Everything I have been talking about in the last one and a half days, of course, I am not here to, I have not see what have been discussed or here, but I am sure this is a focused conference on ethics and legal issues. You must be really debating ethics in everything, starting from the medical education to uh, care and uh, pharmacy and everything else. So, here also you will find time to come, uh, this is going to be addressed in, in telemedicine. So, at the same time, you must always realize this technology has to come to health system. We all realize this has a potential. Now, the very fact it has not come over the last 10 to 15 years in India being already in, in place, so many organizations have taken so much a role in this, ISRO, uh, the uh, IT ministry, the health ministry, uh, so many people have invested a huge amount of money, but why it is not being visible, why it is not being perceived by the patient and public, that is because of these complexities. It is a huge list, I do not want to just go through that, the slides are there, I am sure it must be available to you later on, you can go through that and do please think over, should we just be entangled with these issues. And at the end, you, many of you are hospital administrators, you just cannot escape from this thing, whether it is electronic health record or it is uh, um, uh, telemedicine, you are always going to be uh, in, in a mess. So, how we are going to handle, to please prepare. As the chairman has already said, this is an emerging area and you have to prepare yourself as a hospital administrator, how to deal with uh, this kind of environment that is coming in, in the future. But at the same time, the administrator should make sure before establishing telemedicine in the hospital that take care of all this list that is provided here. You should have a good trained people to handle it. You should have some kind of SOP in, uh, in place. You should have some kind of consent system in place. You should make sure that your infrastructure is secure and up to date 24 into 7 working. So, all this thing has to be there. You can find in the long list that always we provide to people when you uh, install a telemedicine system there. Now, once you not forget in your day-to-day -day practice, uh, the information security. So, here also it is very important when you talk of the information uh, security. And the, uh, the entire uh, the knowledge and the process uh, of telemedicine has to be accepted by the patient because patient, you do not really realize because our patients are illiterate. No, that is not true. You see the new uh, NEHA guidelines coming up, National Health Authority guidelines, which is now of course uh, National Digital Health Authority. So, all those things protect the right of the patient. So, one should not forget to take care of the patient's uh, concerns about that thing. And provision of enlisting of credibility of practitioners for telemedicine. You do not have a kind of licensing system. This is coming up nowadays actually. Some universities are providing master's courses for e-health to practice, but not in India. So, that is we, have, we want to contemplate in school of telemedicine to uh, give you a short kind of courses online uh, while you are in job, you can uh, take it up actually. And do you have any time you realize when you talk to the patient, do you keep a privacy? That is very, very important point. Of, even do a video conferencing, it has to be enclosed comp uh, compartment, the technician should be out of the room and it is a privileged communication happening between the patient and doctors. So, all these uh, things are very, very important. Now, just imagine in a telecom medicine uh, consultation process, huge amount of videos are being there, 10 minutes, 5 minutes. Where will you store these things? The loss is that you keep medical records for 10 years minimum. Now, what will uh, do in this case? It is not being addressed. 
Now, we do not have a protocol till now in internal medicine. I am just highlighting these areas because for all of us to really ponder over and work on these things in the future. Now, the health information in India is not integrated with technologies as is happening in the western countries. So, that also needs to be looked at actually and then the, of course, the language, time zone, cultural variations, all these things are there. In the morning, we have been discussing about medical tourism. So, you have been discussing your patient with some uh, country where uh, they do not understand your language and, and your records are in English. So, all these things have to be taken care of. Now, just see this pattern actually. In a day to day practice, you, you talk to the patient everything the therapy alternatives, the benefits, the harms and risk. Now, in, in telemedicine encounter, such a short, short time you get, can you really explain all those things to the patient? It is you have to do, because telemedicine does not just make the system different. It is same as face to face encounter. Now, the coming to the negligence part. Now, the professional negligence and the issues of duties, liabilities, responsibilities of consultation, prescription. Do you know that a prescription is not at legal in this country? There are several parliament questions on that. And now, who holds the baby? Who is responsible? It is all cyber environment. Everybody wash up their hands. Though you have evidence in, in your computer, who has given what uh, consultation? So, time has come to stop this transferring the baton without taking responsibilities. The ISRO, when they introduced the television program, Dr. Satyamurthy will talk about you. They say that the consultation has to be between doctor to doctor. Now, you tell me how many times you are supposed to have a doctor in the opposite end. You say that the technology should reach to far flung areas. In far flung areas, where are doctors? Do you have any kind of permission from doctor talking to patient directly? No, legally no. Now, coming to the reliability and accuracy of digital image data, because all this depends on the technology, what kind of compression you use, what kind of bandwidth you use. So, the image may be distorted, giving different kind of interpretation. So, all the list, you know, there is not much of time to discuss because session is going late. So, please go through these things and overall do not just ignore these things. Now, the storage is outside your hospital environment, it is in the cloud. And the cloud, just like internet, nobody knows, nobody is secure. Today, I mean, you have just heard about the one hour uh, the virus. I mean, it has really made the, the paralysis of the NHS. It is just a fresh face in the news. So, we are at risk actually. Now, overall, like in all your uh, medical practice, we are very much scared about that. Surgeon opening abdomen, somebody is showing the legal issues. So, you have to be very careful this cartoon actually, that we are always surrounded by the legal issues in, in our mind. Now, last uh, two or three slides, no clear separate telemedicine and electronic medical related health laws exist in this country. Let me tell you that. It is very important. We have to address it. Of course, ministry is concerned, they are taking up one by one. First, they have taken the uh, electronic health record issue, now they will take up this also. Now, the lack of legalization of teleconsultation and enlistments of requirement of teleconsultant, who is supposed to give telemedicine service. The lack of provision of teleconsulting in insurance sector. Infrastructure development, remuneration issues, reimbursement issues, area of jurisdiction are not yet uh, clear. Now, these are the laws that currently exist, both in technology side and also in uh, uh, related to the your uh, service side, both in terms of drug, like just now we heard about dispensing the medicines in that was uh, told by Colonel Chaturvedi, they are not legalized. But at the same time, we need such kind of thing. Government of India has prescribed 10 essential medicines that should be available in any place in the country. So, how that can be possible without technology? So, we have to develop stricter law or make technology more safer, make law into place, so that no council can object about that. At the same time, we should not forget Indian constitution says right to privacy for all persons. So, that we should not forget even if a technology is coming to this. Now, at the same time, this last two slides just show you the thing that is happening internationally. Everybody is concerned. However, they have addressed it, they have already have some guidelines, whether it is European Union, whether it is uh, United Kingdom, Australia, South Africa, all of them. And do you know Malaysia is the first country in the entire world, they developed the telemedicine law way back many years. However, in Malaysian telemedicine program collapsed, so also the, everybody forgot about telemedicine law, what has developed in Malaysia. But that was the beginning, we always refer to that, that document, uh, that is enacted actually. So, that means, we should stop practice telemedicine. No. It is the future. So, we have to make a balance and as you have been discussed in the morning also, communicate with the patient, whatever you do, day in and day out, you communicate in the mobile phone with your patient. Am I not correct? Am I not correct saying that you are exchanging a lot of images to WhatsApp? Your patient demands, doctor, can I just uh, send my follow-up report through WhatsApp rather than coming uh, to your hospital so many kilometers away? I did not tell the patient. So, that is exactly what is happening. Your next generation, your ch children, they ask, why can't this happening in your uh, medical practice? So, 
Now, what is the future direction? The future direction is standardized format. Telemedicine healthcare courses, that is what we are there for school of telemedicine. Responsibility of privacy, confidentiality and security of the patient, qualification and skills of the teleconsultant, accreditation, building uh, kind of confidence, then provision of remuneration. You have to think about that, but in a very legalized way. Now, the medical insurance system should also adopt telemedicine. Cross-border issues has to be addressed, especially if you are involved in medical tourism. Standards and interoperability issues also have to be addressed. It is already in place. We have to adopt those things. Instrument and services, there are also followed some kind of legal authorities, that kind of Medical Devices Act. Licensing, telemedicine law, e-health portals for regulation and grievances. So, all these things are very much important. Last slide, I have given a lot of references. You can go to the Google, you will find a lot more references. If you are interested in this area, especially the medical administrators, they should uh, refer it. It is a future tech research area. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. You pointed out that technology is evolving very fast, but the process of assimilation of laws governing it takes longer. Dr. Satyamurti, Professor Satyamurti, you had been at the helm of affairs of ISRO and uh, with telemedicine of India, you are a member, you had been past president. Can you tell us that starting journey from 36 kbps bandwidth to 4G now, where the regulation or law stand at present? What are the administrative issues which Dr. Mishra posed about the data security? Somebody may steal the data from the hospital. Somebody loses his mobile. And if the data is taken away by someone, what are the laws? Can we prevent it or can we minimize it? Uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Shakti Gupta and the AIMS for giving this opportunity and thank the panelists to be associated in this important session of telemedicine. It is indeed a very important thing that telemedicine, which is a emerging field, is picking up well. In fact, if you see how telemedicine started its journey in US and finally there was a, almost a 20 years of gap till it could be brought into a semblance of usage and suddenly it jumped. By, by, by leaps and bounds. In India, tele telemedicine was started in the year 2001 and uh, when some of the few district hospitals as a pilot project, ISRO initiated since uh, the then president Abdul Kalam had uh, suggested that ISRO has the satellite connectivity, can we help the healthcare community to bring the doctors and patients together? In this endeavor, ISRO started the pilot projects and connecting some of the district hospitals to the specialist hospitals because we had a panel of doctors who suggested that we should start from top-down approach, not the bottom-up approach because we should not start from the primary health center due to various reasons. Therefore, the top-down approach of connecting district hospital to the specialist hospital was the one which was ventured into. And that was the one which gave great success. Notable among this important work has been with All India Institute of Medical Science when it was connected to some of the district hospitals in Haryana. And then the PGPMA Chandiga when it was connected to some of the district hospitals in Punjab. And the SGPGI Lucknow which took uh, under Dr. Mishra's leadership took a giant leap in establishing a school of telemedicine center and also connecting some of the, uh, the uh, rural hospitals, not from to Varissa to Uttar Pradesh. These are all some of the not notable things. So with the pioneering efforts of ISRO and the Department of IT, several pilot projects initiated and that's where the committee was constituted 
for writing out some of the important standards and any of the legal requirements required. This is where the satellite connectivity provided by ISRO free of charge, given the equipments free of charge, was started by 2005. You name the state except a few. Many of the district hospitals were connected. Some I was involved in doing the same in 600 hospitals, 400 hospitals, district hospitals, and 200 village resource center brought the satellite connectivity, the technology of telemedicine, the doctor-patient interaction, and also what should be the future and how we should go about. And that was the time when Dr. Mishra uh, started the movement with the formation of Telemedicine Society of India, which was formalized in 2005. And then uh, it was the then uh, the, special, uh, the special conference attended by probably many of you might have attended the National Task Force was formed for, with a terms of reference for bringing telemedical education, teleconsultations, and then legal aspects, and also the security, privacy aspects. They were all constituted into a several committees, and the reports were given to the Ministry of Health. And that was the time when the Ministry of Health for, and the uh, Ministry of IT brought out the standards. And presently, we are almost in the state of getting the Telemedicine Act by the Government of India, the draft act being taken up for discussion by the separate committees. So Dr. Mishra has already spoken about several aspects of ethical, legal, and uh, administrative issues. S since being a technologist, I would like to, I'm uh, one of the few among this big doctor, uh, uh, the illustrious doctor community, that I am one of the few being a technologist. I would like to go into the technological aspects as the question asked by Colonel Chaturvedi, that when we started, the satellite bandwidth was available and we were not very sure how much is the bandwidth required. And that was the time when the doctors suggested that they wanted a very good bandwidth. If it is, you want to have a video conferencing, you need a bandwidth of 384 kilobits per second. If you want to do a surgery, and you need a bandwidth of 1 Mbps. So that was the time when the bandwidth we were not knowing, and there were, we were talking about sending data to the village where there was no connectivity. How can we send data? through a very small bandwidth, 34 kilobits per second, 64, 128. So the digital, yeah, you know, the spectrum was searched to get the proper bandwidth for proper teleconsultation. If you want to send a image, you need a bandwidth of something like 128 kbps. And if you want to do video conferencing, you need a bandwidth of 384 kbps. If you want to have a very good surgery and then teaching, you want to demonstration, you need a bandwidth of one megabits per second. These were all some of the aspects ISRO took up and satellite bandwidth was controlled through control stations. And then the software aspects. So there are companies, there are uh, department of IT, they were developing ISRO got some of the softwares developed by industry. And then the softwares, the pla we didn't have a platform and a platform had to be brought in. And there were, that was the time when in the year 2005, we had a platform in which multi-point connectivity could be done, and then it could be very useful for connecting different hospitals. In fact, the multi-point connectivity came up from All India Institute of Medical Science requirements when they said that our doctors cannot be going to, the, they are so busy, they cannot be going to a telemedicine center. Is there a way you can get us get the patient to our department itself through the virtual network. That was the time the multi-point connectivity, the technologies were all formed. And then today, you have the technology, and uh, Dr. Mishra mentioned, the technology is changing. In fact, we started telemedicine, which was called telehealth. It's nothing but in the Western parlance, it is called as the e-health. And then now, with the mobile, onset of mobile, it is called the m-health and tomorrow it will be called the Internet of Things. So it is, if whether it is controlling the fridge from a home through internet or controlling a patient in an ICU through an internet, that will be the order of the day. And this is how the technology has evolved. And technological safeguards, technology is a tool. 
it will do everything it will follow if it is not following a legal requirement it shall follow so that's how it is the bandwidth or the security issues of a software if a banking system with where the financial systems are so intricate if a cloud can be used why not the cloud can be used or cannot be used for healthcare in fact why not the security if there is such a tight security in the banking system financial system what is the security required for patient care it's very simple what patient expects his record should not be published and that's how how you transmit data in fact the technology has come you can transfer still images of x ray moving images the graphic images of uh, ecg and then one of the most important thing is the patient emr in fact lots have been talked lots have a uh, lot of work has taken place the patient emr fields which is a subset from the hospital information system which follows hl7 the dicom images they are all in place if you are following the uh, the uh, security in a hospital information in a big system following similar security in a, for a telemedicine is much much simpler so what i would like to say is the telemedicine technology is not above the law it is always it follows the law so the technology there is no point uh, in telling anything about technology it will follow the legal ethical social uh, aspects the important thing is how you are going to run it that is the thing so the administrative challenges of telemedicine come into picture here some of the administrative challenges when we implemented it is more than one and a half decades since we have brought telemedicine in this country and then it was in the year 2010 india had the largest network with all the many of the states trying to practice doing the uh, giving the telemedicine service with their own passion there are some of the passionate doctors here who are, who are also in the panel and doctor uh, some of the doctors in many of the institutions they have taken up but we need more doctors it was the time when technologists drove the telemedicine but the time has come it is the doctors who are driving and it is going to be the most successful thing which can be a part of the digital india so in this context i would like to cite a few issues one is telemedicine e health in uh, m health infrastructure in fact whenever we talk to now after my uh, establishment in, of uh, telemedicine in the country through the efforts of various uh, stakeholders the government hospitals the specialist hospitals the doctors the health administrators after my retirement from isro i am with uh, some of the agencies how you can implement i have been implementing in karnataka and in fact in 2010 the isro slowly withdrew their connectivity because they had given technology connectivity for almost a decade and they said now you can be on your own and uh, many of the people said no you have to continue to hand hold and isro has agreed to a limited extent this was the time alternative connectivities were brought in and uh, that's where one of the important thing is how you can use the wide area network the mobile connectivity and all that major challenges are the uh, the infrastructure for telemedicine the telecom connectivity get the rural areas where even the bandwidth something like 64 kbps 120 kbps 128 kbps is sufficient so the cost of infrastructure though several uh, i mean lot of money is spent in the building the infrastructure of a hospital the infinite decimal cost of building a communication architecture uh, infrastructure is very less it should be is one of the important things uh, and the next can, is uh, electrical uh, power situation. we can take up questions ah. and that time these things may come up okay uh, may request you be, to be more brief yeah so that uh, we can yeah with this uh, i have a uh, couple of administrative things one is cost of infrastructure electrical power situation language barriers and then the uh the inf uh, information exchange resistance to adaptation and change there has been the resistance which need to be done then then incentivization of doctors for doing telemedicine and then uh, uh, integration of telemedicine across the medical domain where whether it is 
uh, you know, telecardiology. Tele it started with cardiology and radiology. Today, telepsychiatry is one of the important things, like that various fields and management of information system. All should be brought in. They are all the challenges. Thank you, Professor Satyamurti. We very vividly brought out the spectrum of telemedicine. Uh, but uh, still we find that uh, ethical and legal issues are still a draft, though we are practicing it. And I can realize the difficulty of Dr. Agrawal, but I want to know how you are facing in AIMS all these challenges and how you are solving it so that our audiences, when they go back, they can also practice it or overcome those issues. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving the opportunity. Actually, when you look at telemedicine, uh, it is a success waiting to happen for the last 50 years. And we'll be continuously telling that it is, it is going to be the next big thing. But for some reason or the other, it has not really caught on to the mainstream. One of the things which I think is very good in India is there is lack of administrative as well as legal you know, uh, system in place. Because innovation cannot thrive when there is too much administrative control. And because of that, a lot of innovation is occurring all over the globe, which uh, Dr. Mishra also talked about, including social media, including so many other ways of getting through your complaint. I think the most important thing which we have to keep in mind is ethics, which doesn't need to have a regulatory framework. So if you're ethically clear that you're doing a good for your patient, everything else becomes secondary. And at AIMS also, we have been trying because obviously we did not have any uh, regulatory framework to act upon. We have been innovating and trying to find ways to use telemedicine in non-traditional ways. So traditional ways, we already know about point-to-point -point video conferencing with doctors, with patients. I'll be talking a little differently to show you how practically currently we're using at AIMS and where each one of us can further use it. And the three broad areas we're using it is first in patient care services, second is in research, and third is in education. So I'll talk a little briefly about each one of them. In patient care services, we are actually using it firstly in inpatient. Now you might wonder why and how can we use telemedicine in patients, patients who are already admitted or into your hospital. When a patient comes to the emergency department, you know, and all emergency departments in the government sector in India are staffed by the junior most residents. So that is, that is the harsh reality we have. And those residents have to look at the patient, take decisions, do everything. So again, telemedicine becomes life-saving in those cases because they can, I, I'm, for, I'm a neurosurgeon, so they can send me the CT scans, send me all the details, I can look at, make on the spot decisions staying from home whether this patient needs operation, whether this patient needs admission. These are critical decisions which are changing the paradigm in managing patients every day. The second is when the patient actually leaves the hospital. We are discharging these patients and we are trying to put in a system in place because the most common complaint the patients have is that we have not been told discharge advice appropriately or given enough time for that. So what we are doing is, rather than telling them that yes, you come after one week, which is the scheduled visit, one week or one month, when they come back to the OPD to show to the respective doctor, we have a nurse intervening who will fix up a teleconsultation with them within 24 to 48 hours. And we'll go over the discharge summary and all the hundreds of mundane, mundane for us, but for each patient, it's a very huge problem whether they should take a bath, whether they should eat before meals, have the medicine, all these kind of things sort it out. So it is putting another layer which improves the quality of care for the patient's perspective. When we talk about outpatients, we, we can look at it again within the hospital and outside the hospital. Within the hospital, we currently have a program going on in dermatology wherein our outreach centers, we have one in Ballabgarh, the senior residents actually see patients and 
they take the images through an app and send it across to main names where they are reviewed in the next 24 hours and told, okay, whether they actually need what you have said is correct or not. So this is again putting a quality layer because the consultant cannot be there at all times and the resident who's posted there can make more informative decisions and see more patients. So these are small, small things which are really making telemedicine a success as of today. The third thing is obviously which is the buzzword is having patients have an actual telemedicine episode with the doctors. And so many sites and apps and everything have come up trying to do this, make money. What we at Ames are doing, we have integrated a software inside the NIC e-hospital software, or what we call this Ames Video Clinics, AVCs, wherein any patient can take a video appointment. So what, because this is a voluntary service, we have out of the 400 clinical doctors or consultants, 100 have already signed up for this, and the, what they say is, okay, we will devote one hour for this purpose, per week. So one hour in their chamber or wherever they feel like, they say, okay, this is the time, we send one nurse from the department with the laptop or something, or iPad, they set up the consultation, the nurse first shows them the patient's uh, history, because history and, and other investigations, the patient can upload on the e-hospital portal. And the doctor has a brief conversation and tells them, okay, fine, this is what you're supposed to do or not to do. And that is again transcribed by the nurse and sent as an email to the patient. Now, all this is a gray area, you know, in terms of prescribing, in terms of emailing, in terms of seeing patients. But we're all doing it. Because unless we do it, the regulatory framework will never come. You cannot put the cart before the horse. So all these things are issues which I think over time, as and when people get more educated, more aware of what they want, will obviously become a mainstream thing. We cannot suddenly become like America and have very tight privacy laws because most of the patients are poor, illiterate, and whatever is there on the ground is zero right now in terms of giving health care to those, to those who want really or who really deserve it. So whatever extra you can provide a layer, I think it's going to benefit all these patients without undue administrative and legal framework in place. The second research point I said, telemedicine can be a huge thing in research. Why? Because our currently our follow-up rate is less than 40%. All patients, we, we all know that. Patients don't come up for review for a variety of reasons. Again, telemedicine can really help you because you can have a cadre of people, call center, nurses, whatever you feel like, calling them up at regularly instead of them coming here, making sure the follow-up is happening, making sure whatever you wanted to know, whether the patient is alive or not, what is the scores which can be interpreted or administered by paramedical staff, put into system so that finally you have data, proper data on a large sample size. So I think that's a big, big success which is already happening. And finally, what I think about education, telemedicine education has its own successes and failures. We have a pan-African project in uh, which uh, AIMS is the nodal uh, agency where we, funded by the Ministry of External Affairs, where we provide medical education by in terms of, through telemedicine, in terms of seminars and teaching courses to a lot of African countries. It's a beautifully technologically very nice platform and everything, but, and there's a doctor scheduled who goes in and talks for each specialty, but on the other end, the 20 odd countries uh, stations, hardly one or two people are sitting in each place. So for anything to succeed, the interest has to be there. With so much of YouTube and every data available in so many platforms, webinars, I. I'm sure none of us ever watches any webinar. We have constant emails and everything come in that watch this webinar, watch this webcast. Nobody's got the time or inclination. Because the pace of things has changed dramatically. However, if you have information which is pertinent and which is useful, 
and here comes the education part instead of trying to educate doctors or other healthcare professions which obviously is a important thing if we try and educate the patients where they feel they are not being educated enough for example consenting so if you are going in for a procedure any surgery the consent part is something which is very important we all know but which is very callously taken at all levels so if that consent can be made into a video in that language specifically for that department for that hospital with the mortality morbidity all complications there specific to that department put on the social media or on a electronic platform and told to the patient that look you can watch this video as many times as you want and then come back with the relevant question that is telemedicine so i think there is a huge scope we are just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of utilizing it and obviously each one of us has to keep thinking ahead like technology has gone ahead and use this to make sure it becomes a success thank you uh, thank you dr agrawal so we realize that if there are no regulations if there are no licensing requirements the development or pace of development is very fast so the blessing in this guy uh, i have a question from uh, to you let's say that there is a app and let's say it's a chest pain app a patient has chest pain he opens his smartphone goes to the app app says that where is the pain he points it okay uh, is it burning pain or it aggravates with the exercise do you have sweating do you have family history smoking and all and says that perhaps you got anginal pain take the tablet sublingually and go to nearest hospital patient dies now let me tell you that this patient happens to be either in dhule maharashtra where recently the doctor was bashed up or in patna now where these patients relatives will go to bash the doctor or i'll say that as per law the lawyer should sue whom one who made the app or the doctor whom he was taking treatment or the patient dies near the hospital who is responsible so that's a very pertinent question and i feel it has uh, as everything it has uh, two sides to the coin one is having a algorithm in place that is obviously needed you know we, we, there is no perfect algorithm and everybody is trying to get so that at least you can screen patients in a semi automatic or automatic manner so that only the requisite number of patients come to the hospital so that is i think the aim of all these apps and uh, nothing is perfect so it will take some time however we have always to have disclaimers or other pointers in this app that look this is just a screen and you should obviously obviously go always talk to the nearest doctor or take a consult that is number one and i think all these apps have that but having said that there always is required to improve the screening capability because the resources are not available in this country to look after all the patients and using technology like this app or any other app which gives you a human middleware or a automatic middleware to screen can really help the large population of the country obviously with any any system in place you have to decide whether you want a system which serves the maximum people most cost effectively or you want every person to get a you know a ct angiogram of the heart done <laughs> just to rule out a Uh, MI or something. So yeah, that. So, that so uh, we can take a few questions from the audiences. Please raise your hands. No comments, and uh, ask directly whom you want your question to be addressed to. Identify yourself, please, from the back. Mike, please. Good afternoon, panelists. Um, I'm a strong advocate of uh, technology, and hence. Uh, I, I want to ask this question to Professor Satyamurthy and then Dr. Deepak. Um, I'm not sure to what level we have gone into the depth of uh, framing the draft for the Telemedicine Act, um, and 
uh, whether there were long deliberations and discussions have happened. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to know is specific to teleradiology. This is just an example that I'm quoting uh, because we need to look into the uh, regulatory acts that we have right now. Um, a tele, uh, generally, according to the act, the radiologists need to be registered with the local regulatory authorities. And you need to have, I'm a healthcare administrator, so this is very specific because I'm finding it challenging. A radiologist need to be registered and his name should be written on the certificate which I need to display in my hospital. However, when I look at teleradiology, today some of the hospitals are offering outsourced uh, teleradiology services. How can I get their signatures? And how can I, so for example, Columbia Asia, uh, if I have to say, is doing really well in teleradiology. However, they are not able to expand in India because our law requires radiologists to be registered in the local, uh, uh, in the local uh, healthcare, uh, with the healthcare authority, and their name should be displayed. They need to sign on that certificate. I don't know how that's going to happen. Yeah, I will request uh, Dr. Mishra if you can throw some light on this. Uh, I'll take uh, things in general rather than just teleradiology. I mean, everything being practiced in this country, let me tell you that. Teleradiology, telecardiology, everything being practiced, right? Even the apps that somebody asked a question. But however, there is no legal sanctity to anything. So one has to be very careful what you are doing. Whoever is doing, they're responsible. Now, coming to specific to teleradiology. Teleradiology has been uh, in practice by two or three organizations in a very massive scale. And it is in a business uh, scum, uh, kind of uh, uh, model they have developed in the country. To the best of my knowledge, uh, if you talk of the, uh, the Bangalore uh, hospital, Samnara and Hidala, uh, sorry, not, that has come out later. Earlier is the Kalanpur. So the Teleradiology Solutions, so they are governed by the US laws. They started teleradiology for the uh, US clients. Then uh, many of these Indian hospitals also sought uh, their services. And uh, they're not governed by any uh, guidelines or anything uh, as far as the best of my knowledge, uh, neither by the government-led guidelines, which doesn't exist, neither any association of radiology has ever recommended. So whoever is doing, uh, they, are, they have their own uh, guidelines. Later, two uh, hospitals, again, very major hospitals, very big corporate names, they are also practicing uh, teleradiology. Uh, but however, uh, there is no legal sanction. I don't know where from you uh, are referring those guidelines uh, that we would like to be educated. Government is taking step. It takes time. If you see the IT Act, do you know when is the IT Act last was formed? 1990. Even your Society Act is 1880 something during the British days. Still, you have not changed that Society Act. So it takes time. Uh, it will take. It will definitely be made one day, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, sir. I just wanted to clarify. See, yeah. PCP and DT Act specifically suggests that you need to register your radiologist. That is actually ultrasound. That is ultrasound. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you no, know, CT, MRI are also radiologists. Now, every radiologist certificate. Like I have, look at my certificate in my hospital. Okay. I have all my radiologists registered, including the sonologists as well as the CT, MRI radiologists. Now. If I'm talking about teleradiology, I need to register them. The law says that I need to register them. But then for teleradiology, it doesn't matter because... Some I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Support. What are you quoting? What, what that act they're quoting of? PNDT act concerns only ultrasound. They're talking of some other act. No, no. Latest thing that has come up? You, uh, you need a digital health policy document? The health policy document of... Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm not aware about that, but yeah. uh, what well, we are working with the telemedicine division, right. we're in the process of uh, forming these drafts. Yes, yes. So, yeah, so that, I don't that's know one of the this. things I wanted to just. Yeah, uh, what happens is the reports are seen by a shadow radiologist. So if you're sending the, uh, these images or anything to whatever teleradiology center, they're reporting on it. And to just circumvert the laws, whatever law is there, doesn't make a difference. They send the unsigned report back to the local center and your radiologist signs it. And it is valid for all purposes. Yeah, that, that's the workaround. So that's that's the oh, India works on workarounds. <laughs> <laughs> but that is a completely legal way, you know. Yeah. You ask that you are taking a second opinion from a senior radiologist or from a teleradiology center, and then finally signing it off. Your name is there on the report. Right. But I'll take the turn. Uh, just to uh, uh, ask questions? another question. Uh, now, if are there any cases of litigation in teleradiology, and if not? 
if something happens and you go to court in the absence of the regulations, then how will it be tackled? Can you help us in uh, a complaint? Because I have been told in the government, let a complaint comes, then we will act. Yes. Please help us in <laughs> litigation. Because we have been trying for the last so many years, we, we failed to you know, gather momentum. I so invite such kind of complaint. No, from the beginning of telemedicine till now, we have always brought the network when ISRO formed, consulted the legal and also the doctors. It should be the doctor, since it's tele between a remote and a, uh, a remote play, a hospital connected to a specialist hospital, it should be a doctor to doctor contact. So as Dr. Agarwal mentioned, the sonologist, there is a, a local doctor in a district hospital, he sends the X-ray or CT, MR, whatever it is. And the expert in the medical college or uh, specialist hospital sees and he gives his report to the doctor and the doctor signs the report. That has been the practice for the time being. Probably there may be some other acts coming up, I mean uh, the regulations coming up later. I just wanted to ask that if today there is a litigation, then are there any things in terms of compensation? We had a session on compensation yesterday afternoon. So, uh, what are the guidelines on that? So, suppose today uh, the gentleman said that there's no complaints, but today, so let's hypothetically assume that there is a thing which goes wrong. So, how do we deal with that? Is anything, uh, any guidance on that? There are no guidelines. We are all governed like other medical acts. That's the same thing is applicable. applicable. Because we do not, we, uh, till now, we didn't have any medical equipment act also. Everything was by Drug Control Act, Drug and Cosmetics. Now, of course, it has been put in Parliament. It has been law also. Let's see that even app, medical app and all those things, it will be governed by that. But till such time, we have to do adjustments and use our prudence and interpret accordingly. Dr. Shakti Gupta, you have some question. Uh, uh, Transmission from the telemedicine center to the healthcare facility or medical command center, medical command center. and uh, who is going to be there legally uh, responsible? Because if there is a corruption of data, there may be distortion of the picture. It could be the incomplete information which is available to the medical command. With the result, it is going to have a wrong decisions, or it is going to have a wrong interve uh, intervention. So is this the, the person who has generated the data he is responsible? Is it the telecommunication system which is responsible? Is it the computer networking which has been directed that is responsible? So who is accountable in that legally? So I think in draft regulations we must have yeah, recommended no, something. No, there are no uh, draft regulations. Michelle. See, for example, uh, um, IIT ministry in 2003 developed some kind of uh, guidelines and they also recommended uh, the guidelines for the IIT infrastructure for health. It's a very old document. That's the only document available in this country, actually. But if you see the international uh, guidelines, see, uh, if you are a consulting doctor, you are giving consultation to, to a particular institute, a particular uh, peripheral hospital, if you are not satisfied with the quality of the image or data, then you have got definite uh, kind of duty to ask for clarification because the image is not clear. In my presentation, I showed that, actually. So anything, distortion of medical data, whether it is image, information, anything like that, you are supposed to clarify it further till your satisfaction, right? That's why when my clinic introduced uh, telemedicine, they always insist that we need time. Deepak also said same thing. Give us time to go through the documents. Uh, of course, there are situations of real-time uh, tele-consultations, like in tele ICU and all those things, but for a routine consultations, at least we had satisfied with the clarity of the images. If not, please ask for uh, the document again. In the failure of network, naturally it is not your responsibility is giving consultations. It is a responsibility of the uh, uh, organizations which is sending the data, you make sure about that. Now, of course, when there is a failure of consultation uh, network, this event is not going to happen, actually. 
So now, who is responsible, like your question, I told you, there are no answer today. These are definitely pertinent questions, and people are addressing it. And if you see, uh, the system has to take care of it. As a health administrator, if you are introducing telemedicine in your know, institute, so all of you have to sit down and make sure that you have a redundant system in your network. If you talk about the NKN, NKN is the best network that we ever have uh, realized in this country. NKN has always ensured that you have a redundant network uh, in case your main network fails. So if you are really practicing telemedicine under a legalized framework, then you are supposed to have alternate things. For example, you, if your main network is not working, then use the other internet-based systems. At least tell the person to send an email attachment if not, uh, the network is not happening. That's why I can say today, as I told you, it takes time, people are concerned, all of you are concerned, government is concerned, but everything takes time. Even the your uh, um, health authority document took three years to do it, actually, after they realized there is need. Now, today, they realize there is need for telemedicine because telemedicine is coming up. So it will take another five years, I'll say. From the technology point of view, there is already some safeguards. Like, you know, when the network is on, at the network control station, they measure what is called the bit error rate and bit error probability. If it is within that particular specification, then at that time, if there is a corruption of data from the communication link, they will be in a position to say that it is not possible, you should not be doing it. As far as the software and other digital part of it, it is already encrypted and all that. There should the amount of corruption is much less. That's the how the technology takes care of it. So, but I just want to add to this is that we are jumping the gun in this case because even for the manual things which are going wrong, for example, pharmacists giving wrong medication because they cannot interpret the handwriting of the physician. That's very common, and it happens. And cases go to court every day because of this because patients die or have adverse reactions because of wrong medication. And courts have, um, teams trying tried to solve this issue and given directions like all doctors to write in capital letters. All kind of these things have come out, but never had, has been implemented. So we have, we will always continue to grapple with the issues. Who's responsible in terms of if something goes wrong from the time you write something or you interpret something and the pharmacist or somebody else interprets it differently. So it, it's a major issue and the manual things have never worked. So let's see if technology takes care of this. There was a conference on uh, telemedicine and still I'm looking for this answer which I have not received so far. <laughs> This is not the complete answer, but the IT Amendment Act talks about a security officer for cybernetics, for all uh, telemedicine and computerized digitization, whatever we do. And part of the job of the security officer is, one is security of data and the second is the quality of data transmission. So I am not aware of any institution which has a security officer for this purpose, but that is what is recommended in the IT Amendment Act. So uh, we can take up last question. Yeah, yeah before summing up. You need to see the Supreme Court guidelines on this. It's very clear. In Kishanrao was a secure super specialty hospital. The Supreme Court held under the heading guidelines to medical practitioners. No prescription should be given without actual physical examination of the patient. So as of now, we recently agreed to this. Doctor to doctor interface is allowed. Doctor to patient interface is not allowed. So in a way, doctor to doctor face is allowed means second opinion can be obtained. In emergency care, it is always an exception that can be used. In these two conditions, telemedicine can be used as per the guidelines of the Supreme Court. Not a primary consideration, only a second opinion. Uh, here I'd like to mention one thing. In different countries, there are different laws. Here also, like in America, three different states. One state says that physical contact should be there. Other state says that it's not required, at least should be once in a year. And third state says, no, it is doctor's discretion as to when he should see the patient. 
if he feels that patient is not required to be seen for a year, it doesn't matter, anything goes wrong, is taken care of by the existing law of land. And here also we have to adopt the same thing, because if they can adopt, we have to adopt, we don't have so much of radiologist, and for next 40 years, we can say that we'll not be having so many doctors, we'll not be having so many specialists, we'll not be having so many radiologists, but we have to provide them care today, and we have to interpret that way. So for security and other things are concerned, yes, law should be there, but when we know Pentagon, papers are leaked, WikiLeaks, we know it. In our own country, so many leaks have been there. What do security you provide? It cannot be foolproof, but that cannot deter us in implementing and giving care to the masses. So we have to be very practical and pragmatic about it. And uh, because short of time, I'll not like to speak much. And I'll thank my panelists for the excellent presentation and talk which they have given and address the questions. And thank you. Thank you, audiences. We now request Colonel R.K. Chaturvedi to felicitate the esteemed panelist. Dr. S.K. Mishra. Professor Satyamurti. Dr. Deepak Agarwal. May I now request Dr. Farooq M. Jung, Head of Department, Department of Hospital Administration, Shere Kashmir, Srinagar, to come on stage and present a token of gratitude to Colonel R.K. Chaturvedi. Thank you, sir. 